Hi, I'm Steven. You can now watch UCF TV 24 hours a day on Bright House Digital Channel 1. I'll start with a uh, video. It will take about two to three minutes. I believe it's uh, NBC. It's been in, in a lot of uh, um, uh, stations, and uh, some of you may have seen it in YouTube as well. Um, and then that will be an introduction to this uh, technology, and then I'll uh, take about 20, 25 minutes. Thank you. Mike Beckman has had to do this every single day for the past 34 years to manage his type 1 diabetes. It's with you every day. He's had bleeding in his eyes, a heart attack, nerve damage, and now both of his kidneys are failing. It's also taking a toll on his family. I have a, a very young daughter. I'd like to see her grow up and see grandchildren. This is where I get very emotional, so. So just bear with me. Soon, researcher Henry Daniel may have an answer for people like Mike, and it could come from lettuce. So this is a totally new concept. Dr. Daniel injects the human gene for insulin into leaves of lettuce that are grown in the lab. The leaves can be ground into powder and put into a capsule. What we have done is to teach the body how to cure this disorder. The lettuce helps the powdered capsule reach the intestine. There, plant cells meet with bacteria and release the insulin. This stimulates an immune response and tells the body to produce its own insulin. The first test was in animals. After eight weeks, all the diabetic mice had normal blood sugar levels and produced insulin, even after they stopped taking the lettuce. Now human trials are planned. Dr. Daniel says this could be a permanent solution. I could literally give up everything other than my family to have a cure. This is Barbara West reporting. Even though I've been teaching for over 25 years, I realize that the public press can do a much better job <laughs> than me in summarizing the story and uh, also the uh, Okay. You know, they have some poetic license that scientists cannot <laughs> take. And uh, so, uh, so, again, I want to thank uh, for creating, uh, Deb, thank uh, you and uh, your group for creating this logo. It's, it's really wonderful. And uh, uh, I'm sure to use this in the future mm -hmm. as well. The technology that I'm going to describe can in essence be summarized in this slide where all the current pharmaceuticals, vaccines, they're very, I'm sure you'll agree that they're expensive. They're expensive for a number of reasons. One thing is producing them in these expensive machines and purifying them and injecting them and you have to refrigerate them, cold storage, sterile delivery, all of this just these two machines usually cost about 500 to 900 million dollars. So interferon treatment for cancer, for example, uh, on an average in the U.S. is $26,000. I'm sure in Orlando, I guess it's 40,000. So this um, is because of this technology which has been developed um, first by Genentech almost 30 years ago, it's 1978 when the first <coughs> insulin was produced. And that's the same technology that's been used over and over again. So I challenged this concept and dogma when I had my first faculty position at Washington State University. And so the concept that I proposed at that time, and it has come a long way in the past 20 and odd years, is to 
eliminate this whole process and produce this in plants. Initially, I started working with tobacco. Of course, you cannot, uh, well, other than, unless you play baseball, you don't chew tobacco. <laughs> so I have to find other systems like uh, lettuce and then make capsules and orally deliver them. Most cost estimates are this could be 100 to 1,000 times less expensive than the current technology. Um, so to advance this concept, then the first uh, step was to introduce the genes into these plant cells. And there are several choices. We have two genomes. We have the nuclear genome, which we get from our mom and dad, and the mitochondrial genome, which we get from our mom. Plants have one more genome. They have chloroplast. It's a third one. That's why they're green, and they have three genomes. So the choices are, there are three places where I could put the foreign gene. And I chose to put it in the chloroplast because of higher yield. This, if you put it in the nucleus, there's only one nucleus. With, two, with the pairs of alleles, you could put two copies. If you put it in the chloroplast, then you could put 10,000 copies. So I projected that you could get lots of proteins. Another major advantage um, you may know that U.S. is one of the pioneers in this technology. Monsanto is one of the pioneers. But Europe still doesn't grow genetically modified plants. They're very opposed to it because the genes fly out through pollen. So when we put it through the chloroplast, then they uh, are transmitted through the mother, maternal inheritance. And a couple of things, one more point is that, so I developed this and then uh, in, in science, you know, when you have some pioneering inventions, there are some good journals. Those days when I was in Pullman, PNAS was the highest impact journal. So when I published this, at that time, this in a, 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 a highly ranked journal, it got the attention of the president of the National Academy of Science, president of the, uh, the American Association of Advancement of Science. So I, those days there was no email. So I got a letter saying that, would you like to come to Harvard and then show us that this can be really doable. And so he basically paid for my um, staying at, at Ratcliffe, <laughs> uh, the guest house, uh, for, uh, he said, well, we'll pay for, for a whole year. You just come and show us how to do this. And at that time, then I had established a concept that the genes can be introduced into chloroplast, but not in a very efficient manner. And there was a Cornell scientist at that time. He was shooting dye into plant cells using a gun. And then he was looking for a scientist who could really shoot DNA. And then so we both teamed up. I used to drive from hardware to Cornell and back and forth. And then we developed this gun technology where you could coat the DNA and really shoot the DNA into leaves. And then you could really express foreign genes. So that was the very, very early stages. In fact, I used to be so scared because um, this initially we used the 22 caliber bullets. And we'll have this bullet stacked up, and we'll have this uh, flame uh, to sterilize. Everything has to be done. So finally, uh, DuPont bought this technology and then developed a helium gun. That's what we are using now. We don't use bullets anymore in the lab. And uh, so it's a much safer technology now. And um, so these are typically the steps. I don't want to go over the, 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 the scientific details of it, except that when you shoot them, we really shoot in the dark. And there are billions and billions of cells, and we look for that one 
needle in the haystack here, and that one single cell. We control the life of that cell by adding hormones, making them put leaves, put shoots. We have learned all of these things, how to do this. And so ultimately, we can take them to the greenhouse. And so at, this is the core concept uh, and uh, technical detail of how this is done. And then uh, we published this, doing this in letters. Actually, I'm so thankful to all these artists who come up with these cartoons. So basically, then you can make the capsules, give it to animals, and then compare the current technology with the future technology, capsule versus the uh, injectables. And then considering that all these are the advantages, and then we will take, uh, really reduce the cost. So the question is, is this technology going to work? And in science, you know, when you dream, dream big. So I wanted to go for the gold, go for the top 10 diseases in the world, and go for the bioterrorism agents, if you see CDC, anthrax and plague at the top. But I myself was born and raised in a developing country, and I know the ravages of cholera and malaria. So I really wanted to use this technology to advance the causes because the vaccines that, the cost of the vaccines, it's just not affordable in developing countries, in Africa, India, Bangladesh, and a lot of other places. So we tried a number of these things in parallel. I'm not going to, I don't have time to go through every one of the, uh, the so I'm going to just give you a couple of examples. Example of a cholera or malaria as a, and then an example of plague as a biodefense vaccine. Okay, now we know how to create this in letters. How can we really deliver it into the uh, animals and then see that this vaccine antigen gets into the circulatory system and initiates an immune response? So for that, again, creative um, strategies. Um, I took the jellyfish gene, it's called green fluorescent protein gene. I put it in plants, so you can see they're glowing in the dark. And I also borrowed the idea of how cholera is injecting its toxin into humans. So I combined this jellyfish gene with the protein that the cholera bacterium is using to inject the toxin into our blood system. When I combine the two, you can see when we feed this to animals, you see the glowing liver. And the green fluorescent protein alone doesn't work. Of course, control leaves doesn't work, but when you combine the two, then you can now introduce the gene, um, the, the protein by oral delivery. So we have found the basic method of how to make a protein and how to deliver it in capsule form to the animals. The uh, first target, you can see, you don't see any red in the US, but I'm sure you want to travel abroad, so you will be in one of these places. And so cholera is, uh, as you can see, a lot of other countries, it's a, it's a major problem. But guess what? There's only one vaccine approved right now, 150,000 deaths, and that vaccine um, loses immunity in less than three years in children. In adults, it's not fully protective. That's how great our science is today. You know, we, 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 we think that we are advanced, but there are a lot of areas for advancement. And so, sorry, uh, we are still, uh, <laughs> it's um, uh, dinner time, but uh, you could, <laughs> the, this is how, you know, when, when you have, when, when cholera causes diarrhea, but if, so we were comparing the injectable versus the oral. And when we did that, wonderful results. You know, all of the orally immunized animals survived. But the beauty is this time, we did the testing for so long, for half of its lifetime. That means for humans, 
this immunity will last for 50 years, not three years. And this both injectable and oral work, but obviously the oral is really cheap and it's very effective. And so the, we monitored the immunity and then we asked a question, why is it that the oral is working so effectively? And we did, uh, scientists, you know, when, when they get results, they're not satisfied, they really keep questioning themselves. Why did this work? Is it a fluke? Is it going to work again? So we examined all of the immunoglobulins and we found that oral delivery induces a special type of immunoglobulin and that is the one that causes this high level of immunity. And the medical community, and unfortunately, has forgotten about this oral vaccines. Our first early vaccine, Salk Institute, was formed b based on the oral vaccine polio. But we don't have polio oral vaccine anymore. And so and we, we have only one uh, uh, rotavirus. It's the only one, if you see on CDC's um, uh, list of oral vaccines. So I have to learn a lot of these con basic concepts in this. And uh, um, then we tried this malaria. Again, pretty deadly disease, about uh, 500 million infections each year, um, a million deaths every year, no vaccine. Bill Gates is trying to fund this, and no vaccine aid. So we developed this high levels, 800,000 uh, level of immunity, and we checked this is a way to confirm the, uh, whether it binds to the parasite. And we had one positive control from NIH. Every one of our things worked better than the NIH positive control. So that's where we are on the, uh, the, the one, uh, one among the top uh, infectious diseases in the world. And we wanted to test this for the biodefense vaccine, because if you see on CDC's list, <coughs> You all are aware of anthrax care and uh, plague, the black plague, you know, pretty much wiped out population in London. It's, uh, and so we took that on. I mean, um, a couple of years ago, we published the anthrax vaccine, which was also very widely uh, uh, in the news. Even Paul Harvey talked about it, and Jay Leno talked about it. And so the, we, we did this uh, plague vaccine, and here is the comparison to the current method of delivery, injectable, to the oral. You can see, except one fat mouse, all of the uh, animals of oral survived. And this survival is not just small survival. If you look at the next table, the, 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 the control animals had 10 billion spores in the spleen. The, the immunized ones had zero. So this is the highest possible level of immunity. Why? Because there are two, one unique kind of immunoglobulin that is made in, 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 in this method. And so, uh, so we are confirming it over and over again with a lot of other uh, things. So having tested this in vaccine, we also wanted to take on the challenge of other major diseases like diabetes and cancer. And in case of diabetes, insulin-dependent diabetes is an autoimmune disorder, and the pancreatic, pancreas, the beta cells are destroyed because it's an autoimmune body, misunderstands its own protein, and attacks the beta cells so that it will stop producing insulin. After oral delivery, we could just bring this back. And, and of course, this is only one example. We scored thousands of these to have statistical. You can get a score, almost a perfect score of one. And of course, once we got the structural integrity, then we wanted to see whether they're really producing insulin. So we checked for two things. One, the insulin is the blue color stain. Cell death is the red color stain. And this is the uh, uh, insulin-fed animals. This is the control animals. You can see the destruction here, whereas you see intact structure and insulin being produced. No cell death. 
And so structurally, we could confirm that we could really prevent the onset of diabetes or insulitis. And this is with only one protein. We now are working with the reversal of late stage diabetes with additional transcription factors. Then we looked at the urine sugar, blood sugar. There's no urine sugar. Blood sugars were normal. So, and this is another amazing, um, the, 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 the surprising level of technical <coughs> advance uh, in, in modern medicine. Insulin has three peptides, A, B, and C. When Genentech developed injectable insulin, they didn't know how to make this complex structure. So they just made only A and B. And that's what is being given for everybody. So if you don't take C peptide, then all these nerve sensations, the neuropathy and the, uh, the retinopathy, all of this is because more and more studies show that lack of C peptide. So if we really fix the structure in the body and if it produces insulin, that means we should be checking for C peptide when this go for human clinical trials. So when we did that, bingo, we get really C peptide levels going back to almost normal. This is of course with aging, we all lose some C peptide, but you can see. And another major thing that we found was that this time we did over 100 animals. We added vitamin A because there was some indication uh, of nutritional enhancement as well. You can see vitamin A plus this pro-insulin almost brought the C-peptide to normal levels. So this is a great tool for human clinical trial because when we uh, administer this orally, even if they are taking current insulin, they are taking only A and B. So if they had C-peptide back up to normal levels, that is because of the cure. That is because the autoimmune disorder was fixed. And so that's where we are on the, uh, on the insulin, but we have a lot of work to do because there are so many other autoimmune diseases, thyroid, arthritis, multiple sclerosis. In fact, uh, uh, last week I got great exciting news of our animal studies. All of these animal studies were done here, except that we shipped our immunized animals uh, for plague challenge to the military lab because we are not allowed to have plague here. Um, uh, other than that, all these studies were done right here. And, uh, but, uh, University of Florida Medical School, where they're close collaborators of uh, ours, so we shipped, uh, we did the animal studies for hemophilia, which is not listed here. We got great results. So we are getting ready to publish that. And so we now know that this concept to cure autoimmune diseases through oral delivery is real. It works for a number of uh, diseases. And one last thing is about, um, since uh, some of you are concerned about cancer, I thought that I would also give you an example that we do work with cancer. And um, as I mentioned, the average cost of hepatitis C treatment here um, is interferon is used for antiviral and anti-cancer. And uh, I believe in Orlando, it's, it's higher than $26,000. Again, because of the way interferon is made. And so first we tested the antiviral activity. So this is the control, the current, current commercial ones. You can see our activity almost a magnitude order higher than, than the commercial ones. And then we tested this for um, cancer. As you can see, this is a lung cancer line. These are the controls and you can just, uh, that is animal to animal variation, but we are able to pick them back. So this is not new information. Uh, the interferon is used for cancer treatment right now. But what we have made is 1,000 times less expensive than the, the current method. And we are trying to deliver this orally as well. In this case, we did the injectable. And so just a couple of slides to brag about um, the, 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 the technology. And uh, so these are the concluding slides. And uh, so uh, when scientists really um, 
uh, one of the dreams for us is to publish the highest impact journal in that particular field. For our field, Nature Biotechnology, Nature is one of the you know, top journals, Nature Biotechnology, Nature Medicine, different journals, and this is our Nature Biotechnology in 2007, <laughs> it was a scary thing when they did this. They called me and said, yeah, we have featured your work on the cover. Let's see, what did you do with that? Really, did anything come out of it? So they did a survey of all the papers that were published in Nature Biotech, and then uh, wanted to find out whether anything, uh, these are biotechnology, so they really need to get out and then do something. And so they started ranking them. And then so we, ours was ranked within the top nine uh, of the past decade. And so I was quite uh, proud that uh, it, it, it met the... Uh, <laughs> and um, as, I, as I mentioned, you know, we have lots of publications and patents, and so we are really moving forward uh, with that. But I want to conclude since Valentine and days around the corner. If you're looking for some bright ideas, using uh, put some science into your gifts. And this is a genetically modified rose, so I don't know whether you have really seen it. So you can, we can, in, in sciences, in this, in, in plant biotechnology, it's so well advanced that roses of colors that you have never seen before, from blue to purple and all the other colors are there, and uh, you can get in Orlando. And, uh, so <laughs> and um, so um, uh, as I conclude, I really want to first thank all the hardworking scientists and investigators in my lab. Some of them are in the audience here. I appreciate all of their hard work. Uh, PK has always been my source of inspiration, and uh, we, uh, um, uh, oftentimes when I come in and park my car, he notices whether my car is there. I always notice his car, <laughs> and I always call him up uh, when I get something exciting. And uh, so he has been my source of inspiration, and he edited this presentation. So he spends time to really on even little things, you know, that, that happens in, 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 the, in the program. And all of my friends, I'm sure you have lots of wonderful things to do. Thank you for coming here and spending this uh, evening. And PK has thanked Shabana already, so <laughs> I, I certainly want to thank Shabana for all her help. She also works in the lab and ke keeps my sanity. And um, um, most uh, importantly, I want to again thank the sponsors, the College of Medicine, doing for all the hard work for, to make this uh, successful uh, presentation in the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.